Ladies and gentlemen, welcome and thanks for joining our latest Veteran Voices program at the National Veterans Memorial and Museum. My name is Colonel Retired Bill Butler. I'm the Chief of Staff and on behalf of our President and CEO, Lieutenant General Retired Mike Ferreter, welcome as we celebrate the 70th anniversary of the Korean War and honor the men and women who served and sacrificed in the name of freedom. Joining us today is General Retired Vincent Brooks, former U.S. Forces Korea Commanding General. General Brooks is also the former Commanding General of U.S. Indo-Pacific Command, which is also a four-star level United States Unified Command. General Brooks's illustrious career of service to our nation started in 1980 when he graduated as the first African-American Cadet First Captain at the United States Military Academy. He retired in 2019 after having served for 39 years. He commanded at every level in the Army from Captain to Four Star General and conducted multiple combat deployments to Kosovo, Afghanistan, and Iraq. Today marks the 70th anniversary of the start of the Korean War. Often referred to as America's Forgotten War, it was the first period of open conflict between the Soviet Union and the United States after the Allied victories of Nazi Germany and Imperial of Japan in 1945. Almost 40,000 Americans were killed in action and over 100,000 were wounded in action. The war was incredibly costly to all belligerents with approximately 760,000 on both sides killed and 180,000 missing. The toll on the civilian populations of the North and South is estimated to be between two and three million men, women, and children. I'd like to provide a brief strategic overview so everybody knows how we got in Korea and to begin with. So before we start with the specifics, it's important to understand how we got there. Uh, during the Yalta Conference in February 1945, when the Allies were meeting to discuss the post-Allied victory in World War II, Joseph Stalin and Franklin Delano Roosevelt agreed that the Soviet Union would declare war against Imperial Japan three months after Germany's surrender. As part of that agreement, the Soviets got Sakhalin Island, the Kuril Island chain, a naval base in China, and control of the Manchurian Railway. Moscow declared war on Tokyo on August 8, 1945, two days after Hiroshima and one day before the bombing of Nagasaki. The following day, on the 9th of August, the Soviet Union conducted a massive invasion through Manchuria and throughout colonial Japan's territory, which included part of the Korean Peninsula. Washington and Moscow agreed to establish a joint, joint trusteeship of Korea, which had been a Japanese colony since 1910. As part of that agreement, the United States and the Soviet Union agreed that Korea would become an independent state and both had established occupation zones along the 38th parallel. Neither the Soviets nor the United States could agree on the type of government to be established, communist or democratic, and both superpowers established competing Korean governments when they're within their occupation zones. The Soviets, with stewardship of the North, and America, with that of the South were firmly established and the stage was set for the Korean War. On the early morning hours of June 25th, 1950, 75,000 soldiers from the North Korean People's Army, the KPA, poured across the 38th parallel and invaded the South, which was the first military action of the Cold War. The KPA was backed by Communist China and the Soviet Union. By July, the United States officially entered the war on the side of the South and by August, the KPA pushed all opposition to a tiny corner of South Korea around the port city of Pusan. Less than five years after the Allies' historic victory in World War II, and the United States was on the brink of disaster and humiliation with a tenuous hold along the Pusan perimeter. For the ensuing three years, the United States, United Nations, and Commonwealth forces battled against the Korean People's Army and Communist China up and down the Korean Peninsula. Peace talks started the summer of 1951, but dragged on through the remaining years of the Truman administration and six months into the first Eisenhower administration before a truce is finalized in 1953. The two Koreas are technically still at war. The demilitarized zone along the 38th parallel is frequently referred to as the most heavily armed border in the world. An off-scene satellite image of the penin peninsula provides a stark comparison of the two countries at night. The north is black, apart for a small area around Pyongyang, the capital, and the entirety of the south is lit up. And now to our president and CEO, Lieutenant General Retired Mike Ferreter, 
and general retired Vincent Brooks. Thanks, Bill. And uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to Veteran Voices and another really great uh, opportunity for us to share with you um, lessons learned and leadership from a really distinctive uh, general officer, Vince Brooks. And, and to you, General Brooks, great to see you again. And awesome, this lifelong friend of mine uh, has always been the, the kind of uh, general officer, leader, um, soldiers, general soldiers, lieutenant soldiers, captain, uh, and always uh, to be counted on and relied, relied. So welcome. It's good to have you here. Thanks, Mike. Great to be with you. Good to see you again. And thanks for all you're doing now to continue to take care of the story of our veterans. Thank you. It's a pleasure. We've got a, uh, an awesome team here at the National Veterans Memorial Museum. We're in Columbus, Ohio. And uh, as you get out and about and start traveling again out there, uh, all you folks, we want to see you here. And in the meantime, we'll continue to program online virtually and, and, uh, and through digital means. So we're going to cover a variety of topics, but we'll center, of course, on the 70th anniversary of the Korean War. Uh, we'll talk about the U.S. presence in Korea, uh, talk a few questions on veterans, and then uh, we'll sprinkle in a little bit about your career and, and, uh, and thoughts on that. Um, during this time as well, we're on Facebook Live, everyone knows, and uh, questions can be sent to us, and then uh, General Brooks will be glad to answer. So. Let's get going. As, as you reflect on the young men and women sent to Korea to fight for democracy, um, what ideas, having served as, as the commanding general there, um, what ideas do you have about their service and sacrifice that led to where we are today? Yeah, Mike, uh, an anniversary like today, 70 years since the start of a war that no one saw coming, uh, it, it really makes you think about what is it that causes war in the first place uh, the reality that policy decisions, good or bad, with foresight or without foresight, will ultimately cause young soldiers, young warriors of uh, all branches and services to find themselves in very difficult circumstances. And the hard lessons of preparedness or the lack of preparedness that were faced by those who were suddenly rushed into uh, the, the cauldron there in Korea is another story. But, you know, I, I, I often think about, as Bill did a fine job of laying out the history that got us to that point in 1950, that there's so many key things that are instructive as we look back historically. Uh, the decisions that were made to try to have a unified Korea in 1947, but Russia wasn't having any part of that. The decision to reduce force presence, especially for combat troops that are on the ground, uh, which is that ultimate signal of commitment uh, anywhere in the world. So Russian combat troops in the north and American combat troops on the ground in the south uh, were withdrawn essentially in 1948, by December of 1948. And there had been some consternation about whether that was going to be a safe move or not, because it was clear that, uh, that Russia was arming and developing a North Korean military just as the U.S. was doing the same work with the South Korean military. The decisions being made at the United Nations, which are still very new, the actions being taken by the new Joint Chiefs of Staff and uh, the newly formed U.S. Air Force, all these things were new at that point in time. But what ultimately came down to it was it was a bad call. And North Korea did indeed invade in 1950, and we were not ready for that. And South Korea could not withstand it just using U.S. air and naval support. And suddenly now you have a multi-service, multi-nation commitment to try to uh, prevent an overrunning of the Korean Peninsula by communist forces. So that's the thing that comes back to me. You have to put yourself into the, the situation of those troops who might have been on occupation duty in Japan and who could certainly hear the voices of national leaders for the previous three years saying, hey, we've got to reduce the size of the military we're going to reestablish our security posture around the world. And even those who were able to hear the conversations about Korea and whether it was very important to the United States or not, and it was not. Uh, the Atchison line, as it's often referred to, really came down through Japan, down to Okinawa, down to Formosa. That was the defending line. And it was really to protect the Philippines and our continued commitments there. And Korea was ancillary to that. And look what it did. 
And so this was a war by any definition. Uh, it's unfortunate that it was ever called a police action. Uh-huh. Everything that you and I know about war and everything that the veterans that you honor there at the uh, Memorial and Museum, that was war. And it was a brutal, brutal war that uh, brought many lessons into our generation of service as well. Fantastic. Um, how about describe the complex terrain and, and the, you know, whenever I'm out in the field and it's cold and I'm wearing Gore-Tex, I, I think about the Korean War. Right? Yeah. So the gear that they had, the terrain and the weather and, and that human dimension as well. Yeah, really, really tough. Uh, so first, Korea has extremes in weather. Uh, it can get extremely hot and muggy in the, in the summertime, uh, super humid, and to the point where it comes into full monsoon, where it just rains for weeks at a given point in time. And of course, Korea had been somewhat devastated already through occupation. There were not trees. They, all of the hillsides had been denuded from uh, about 1915 on through the rest of the occupation in 1945. So about 30 years of denuding the hillsides for lumber that were used for a variety of purposes by the Japanese empire at the time. So it was nothing to shield from wind or sun or rain or as the winter of 1950 showed, incredibly deep Arctic cold. It's too cold to snow in Korea in a lot of places. Too cold. It's a, it's a blast freezer in a lot of places. The ground turns as solid as stone and completely frozen. And contact with it can uh, create a, immediate contact fr- freeze injuries for anyone that touches it unprotected, which the forces were. And so the, I think the expectation was that uh, things might have been over by the winter of 1950. There had been a successful uh, counterattack from the Pusan perimeter, coupled with the Uh, I think very innovative, creative, and dangerous uh, Incheon landing on the west coast of Korea, about halfway up the peninsula. That severed the lines of the North Korean forces that had overextended themselves at that point. And then a general offensive began to occur very successfully, rapidly regaining all lost ground back up to the 38th parallel, and then continuing to advance, essentially an exploitation against uh, the North Korean forces that were really on their heels at that point in time. And it led all the way up to the limits of North Korea's territory, particularly in the west on the border with China along the Yalu River, uh, but into the mountains in the east and uh, just north of the Changjin Reservoir. Uh, The terrain as you go further north, first it's rough everywhere in Korea. And anyone who's been to Korea knows that. And anyone who hasn't, let me tell you, there is always another mountain. It's a mountain followed by a mountain followed by a mountain. And uh, there's serious, serious hills. I remember as you do the the crossing the Tennessee Valley Divide many times as a ranger student many years ago. And the terrain is very similar to that, extremely rugged. Uh, And it's one after another after another. The further north you go, the higher it goes. So the elevation of the hills, the plateaus, and thus the colder it gets throughout the year. And so as this advance was occurring in the September to November 1950 period, they're advancing further north, further into the cold, and then suddenly we have the double onslaught of a historically cold winter in 1950 and the introduction of the Chinese People's Volunteers, uh-huh. neither of which were expected and neither of which uh, our forces were ready for. So you, you've had a chance. Uh, well, first of all, t- tell us um, what units you commanded or oversaw throughout your career so that people understand that you were not uh, a general in a helicopter looking at those hills. Yeah, that's true. It's, uh, I've, I've walked the hills. I think most notable is the time I was lieutenant colonel commanding an infantry battalion of 880 troops, yeah. 80, 80 of which were South Koreans. So I had 800 Americans, 80 South Koreans, uh, part of a program called the Korean Augmentation to the U.S. Army, created in 1950, by the way, and carried on since then. Uh, but you know, as an infantry battalion commander, uh, we were in those hills, and I tried to get along the DMZ everywhere I could because I needed to understand it. I needed to understand all of the invasion routes, all the potential defensive positions, all the potential ambush points, where the defenses were. And in those days, this was 1996 to 98, those were heavily fortified lines. 
the holes for mines were already in place. And every winter, South Korean troops would come out and put sandbags in every single hole for every single landmine. So that if the winter cold came in and there was a an attack, they could literally they could pull the sandbag out of the ground and have a hole already prepared. Because given the coldness of the ground, you can't dig it. And so uh, feeling those hills, living in that same hot, cold, uh, monsoon weather was uh, certainly instructive to me, first about what the veterans of the Korean War endured with a lot less capability than I had, and that we could find ourselves resuming a war that was not finished in their time. But so the whole journey was, you know, being a young paratrooper in the 82nd Airborne Division, leading multiple units inside of that, going off to Germany, serving in a mechanized infantry unit of the Big Red One, when they had a forward element there during the Cold War, standing off against Russia and the Soviet Union. You know, continuation of that same Cold War that turned hot in Korea in 1950. Um, I did some assignments in Washington and uh, as an assignment officer, probably sending you away from troops and making you unhappy. Uh, but I, I didn't answer the phone. Yeah, probably. Just never answer the phone when, when you have Washington calling. Uh, but then from there to the 1st Cavalry Division, a unit that certainly distinguished itself throughout World War II, but in some of its regiments lost colors. They were the ones that were facing that, that onslaught of the Chinese people volunteers uh, at the Yalu River in the West, uh, among other units. Uh, so I, I served inside of there as a battalion S3 as a brigade uh, operations officer as well, in the 1st Brigade. Uh, on from there to uh, the Pentagon, once again, uh, to understand how decisions are made at the highest levels in the Army. Worked as the aide-de-camp to the vice chief of the Army at that point in time. And then fortunately didn't have to stay there long and got to return back to troops. And that's when I came to Korea in 96, 98. After that, had the privilege of commanding a, a brigade of, uh, of combat troops uh, in the 3rd Infantry Division, the, the Rock of the Marne, and uh, deployed with them to Kosovo. Um, after that, back into the Pentagon, so sometimes you can't avoid it, but uh, I learned a lot in there in the Joint Staff and again in the Army Staff, and returned back to the field again where I wanted to be as a Deputy Commander of a Combat Division in Baghdad uh, during the height of the surge, the 1st Cavalry Division once again but with several different units underneath of our charge during that uh, very critical time. I had the privilege of commanding it for a period of time, and then took uh, became the deputy commander of 3rd Corps at Fort Hood, Texas, and then became the commander of the 1st Infantry Division. So it was kind of the second half of my career was like a taking another lap in many ways uh, to the units that I'd served with in the early part of the career. And then uh, on from there to uh, even larger commands, uh, the 3rd Army, uh, Patton's famous army from World War II, I was honored to command it, and it was the the army headquarters for all of U.S. Central Command, ranging from uh, the west coast of Egypt all the way to the west coast of Af east coast of Afghanistan, and all the other Stan brothers except for Pakistan. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the army component commander, I have to make one correction for Bill, I was actually the army component commander of Pacific Command at the time, not all the joint forces, but all the army forces. And then on to Korea for my final assignment. So a long journey, a, a chance to be with troops in a lot of different environments. A lot of things are very consistent from one place to the next. I think um, we'll eventually get to, to the thought that often our army leaders, our military leaders, in fact, have to be dirty boots, soldiers and, uh, and statesmen and often in the same day, and, and you certainly are the example for all of us. Um, uh, we'll, we'll come back to that, I think. Uh, but I, I, I'd like to uh, ask, you know, when we do those picnics and those reunions and the like, and you, you get to sit down next to a Korean War veteran and, and talk to them, what, what are the things that they found remarkable? And then you know, what are your takeaway to be with those great men? Yeah, I'll tell you what. Um... It's, first, is one of the things I really enjoy doing is taking some tribal wisdom from the tribal elders and our warriors of previous generations, men and women are, are our tribal elders. Uh, so I have had uh, numerous encounters with Korean War veterans through the years. I can remember some who were on the staff and faculty at West Point when I was a cadet. 
and just trying to get it in context. You know, they were very senior officers for me at the time, but they had been very junior officers living the hardships in those hills. And many of them talked about that. They talked about the hills, the challenges, the the things that cause uh, their, these were all army, uh, cause their soldiers to perform well or to not perform well. And what leadership looks like at multiple echelons and what the, the illnesses were in the force at that point in time. Uh, I, I had conversations with many of them through the years, especially while I was in Korea. Yeah. The number of Korean war veterans in Korea, Korean Korean war veterans, mm-hmm. it's, it's amazing how many of them there are. And to have conversations with them first are just as spry as they can be. And for what they went through, my, my, my goodness, uh, just a, incredible sense of appreciation for the United States and the United Nations Command, all those sending states, as they were referred to, that provided critical capability that saved South Korea from being consumed by uh, the North Korean attack. There's great appreciation for that, even now. Uh, in that generation. And that's important to take in, to to realize that the work that was done was not in vain. Uh, They would talk about how Korea has grown because of the continued commitment of the U.S. force presence, as well as some of the United Nations sending states who still have some capability and presence on the peninsula, Mm -hmm. and that they have gone from being a beneficiary of international aid and relief to now being a donor, the first country to be able to do that. And in less than three generations, a remarkable turnaround. I talked to American and UN veterans of the Korean War when they come back. And let, me, let me just div- digress for just a second. Sure. I would tell you that the South Korean Ministry of Patriots and Veterans Affairs has the most impressive veterans revisit program I have ever witnessed. I was very impressed by what France does for World War II veterans who liberated France. Korea goes even beyond that. I've never seen anything like it. And so they have multiple visits every year where they fly back Korean War veterans from abroad and let them experience firsthand the fruit of their labor. And for most of them, it's the first time they've seen Korea since they left. And as you and I know, as as veterans ourselves, and as all our veterans know, the recollections you have of the place where you fought are not always the most positive ones, because you're seeing a place at its worst. Right. Uh, But when you see the fullness of time unfolding, 40, 50, 60 years unfolding, and you come back and see the city of Seoul uh, that is now twice the density of New York City, and you see the, the modern skyscrapers and the infrastructure and the bullet trains and the ordered society, and you see democracy flourishing, and you see a strong military that bears our DNA. For many of those veterans, it is literally eye-watering. It, it, it breaks them down emotionally because they can't believe what they're seeing. Their last image of soul was a smoldering heap, and now they see this. Their last image of Incheon was landing in the harbor and seeing the mud flats, and now they see one of the world's largest and most modern international airports. And so it really is phenomenal to just hear the change through their eyes and their their mouths as they describe and articulate it. And I, I find nothing more fulfilling. Thanks. I think um, you know Margaret's father's a Korean War veteran and and spent some time. Uh, as part of our series to video and capture the stories of these great Americans. <clears throat> and um, to highlight what you just said for our, our audience, he is revered in Korea. I mean, it, he and he had a chance to talk about three combat tours in, in Vietnam or his time as a lieutenant and company commander. And he put his Korean uh, kid on that they had given him and, uh, and told the story of Porkchop Hill where he received a distinguished service cross and but what was most apparent was his love uh, for his men that he left there his men that he brought home as well as the love that Korea had for him he and uh, Miss Peggy his Mm -hmm. dear wife for all these years Um, really fascinating uh, as well Um, and, and so as long as we had Berlin then the Soviets didn't and as long as we had troops in South Korea, 
than no one else does. And um, you and I uh, probably would agree without hesitation that none of that's possible without the little the little guy, without the soldier with the rifle, the, the sailor, our airmen and, and uh, Marines and Coast Guard as well. And so it's an amazing, uh, as I know, you, you've done the Manchu mile or the 25 mile or yep. whatever. Four of them. <laughs> yeah, there's no, there's no flat 25 miles in, uh, in that country. Yeah. And so you've been there watching them sweat and uh, with IVs taped to their helmets and, and yeah. you've also been in the room at the strategic level as well. Yes. How, um, a couple other new things occurred during that time and one was that the Army, which had been integrated, um, had been segregated for the first time in this conflict fought. And uh, you've seen a lot uh, in your lifetime with regard to soldiers and, and military members and, and how uh, we work, deal, and, and friend in a, uh, to the greatest extent in, in the country in a colorblind way. Not perfect, but what are, what are your thoughts on how that combat led to so much more in the years for, for our military services and men and women of all races and colors and creeds? Yeah, uh, Mike, I appreciate the question. And anytime we talk about the Korean War, we have to include that as part of the history and indeed the legacy of the Korean War. So the order to desegregate came before the Korean War. The practice of desegregation didn't come that soon. And I would submit to you, isn't complete yet, but it certainly wasn't in practice for another 20 years or so in a realistic way, except places like Korea where combat demanded it. As the war started in 1950, there were still all black units, some infantry units, some artillery units, some logistics units, some signal units, and many of them had been on occupation duty in Japan and were immediately rushed forward into the crucible there on the Korean Peninsula. And they had to operate within their own segregated circles, even though there had been plenty of examples in World War II of units working in tandem with one another and not operating in segregated circles, and that had been effective. But the ultimate conclusion of the services were that it was not effective and it was not worth undertaking. So the executive order is what drove that, not a decision internally inside of the military, but an external executive order from the president to desegregate. There was still reticence, still hesitation to implement that until casualties in 1950 drove the necessity to bring black and white together and later Puerto Rican as well, because there's some very important Puerto Rican units who distinguished themselves as combat infantrymen in those same hills, especially at Jackson Heights, uh, right in the center of the sector. These minority units ended up fighting with distinction. Sometimes they were under great pressure and in lots of cases they were accused of bugging out when in fact the history shows that they were operating pretty much like everyone along the line. They fought gallantly in some cases, especially when they were well-led. Hmm, there's an important point. They didn't fight well when they weren't well-led, when they didn't feel like their leaders had their backs. Whoa, is this a lesson that lasts forever? And the reality is that integration occurred by necessity on the ground in Korea. By 1953, it was a different circumstance than it was in 1950. And by the, the time the armistice came in. Now, there have been periods of time where that has been uprooted or disrupted. In the 1960s, the turbulent 1960s, as the civil rights era was in full swing, uh, that manifested itself into separation inside of formations, even in Korea. And there's a lot of uh, good documentation of the stories of leaders who are trying to maintain this cohesion that we all have to rely on in an environment that has to be ready to fight tonight, and yet it was disintegrating there as it was in other places. And so this has been the journey. The origins are in Korea. Some of the manifestations of problems afterward have been in Korea. And now even uh, in my time having served there, an African-American commanding in Korea, the first one to do that, but there nevertheless. And I never felt unsupported Mm -hmm. because of being an African-American, not by the Koreans, not by Americans, not by the UN sending states. And I'm grateful that that was the case, that that progress has been made. I've got plenty of other issues, plenty of other stories where that was not so, 
Yeah. But for that continuity from Korea at the beginning to Korea now, if we use that as a microcosm of the larger effort, uh, it's certainly an indication of, of real progress. Yeah, thanks for, for sharing that with us for sure. And uh, um, as a, the great star majors would tell us, don't slow down. We, we yeah. have more to do, right? Have more to do. Got another uh, hill. Um, as, we, as we look at a potential reunification, someday what yeah. what do you think are going to be pitfalls or challenges and what what are going to be opportunities um how, how do you how would you view the the things yeah. we know are on track uh or are indicators of, of trouble ahead so it's it's long awaited and the koreans both north and south have a yearning for this when you think about the long history of korea and i won't lay it all out but the long history of it leaves them with boot prints that are not their own on their terrain for generation after generation after generation. And this uh, artificial separation that came for good reasons. I mean, it, all the preparations for Yalta, where do you design the spheres? What are the control areas in Europe? How do you draw the lines? And what those things ultimately turned into was concrete and barbed wire lines. They began as pencil lines on maps made by brilliant people doing the best they could to administratively separate control, but it turned into something much more deadly than that. And so this idea of a reunified Korea has been lingering for a very long time. As I mentioned, the U.S. State Department had full plans for that, active plans for reunification in 1947. We're not there yet, still. The war clearly disrupted that and almost created unification underneath of North Korea lead by force. And thankfully, the United States and the United Nations sending states blocked that. But it resulted in a second stalemate. There had already been one. There was a stalemate at the 38th parallel in 1950, before the war started. And to disrupt the stalemate, we had the North Korean attack. There was another stalemate that happened in large measure from 1951 all the way to 53, this is when the lines are just being uh, fought for literally hill by hill, mile by mile. There were no major advances or breakthroughs except in the far east of the Korean Peninsula where Korean led forces broke through and created the shape that you see right now of the demilitarized zone. And for those who know the geography, if the 38th parallel runs straight through that's not where the demilitarized zone is now. In the western part, the line is actually below the 38th parallel. It belongs to North Korea. In the eastern part, it's way above the 38th parallel. And most of it in the middle is above the 38th parallel as well. So the 38th is no longer the dividing line. But it's a dividing line nevertheless. It was the last main line of resistance, as the terminology was for warriors at that point in time, where the two sides are in contact with each other. Sure. You know, infantrymen like us know it as a, a, a line of contact. The main line of resistance, MLR is what they called it in those days. And that's where the demilitarized zone began to be drawn from. So from that line of contact from west to east, backing up two kilometers in each direction, removing fortifications, heavy weapons, armaments inside of there, trying to get as many landmines out as possible, but not doing a very good job of it, still heavily, heavily mined. And now you have this area that separates it. Well, the Koreans are waiting for this reunification that hasn't come. I had the privilege of, uh, as the commander of U.S. Forces Korea, but really as the combined forces commander of U.S. and South Korea, to participate in the inauguration of the current president of South Korea, President Moon Jae-in. That was the only foreigner in, in presence there. Not even the diplomatic corps was invited. And I found it uh, notable that part of the constitutional oath that is taken is to seek and gain a peaceful reunification of the Korean Peninsula. That's what the president of the Republic has sworn to pursue. And so, what are the pitfalls? You asked an excellent question on that. First, what does a reunified Korea look like? Is it a federated communist North and democratic South? Is it one single system of government? And if so, which one? 
there's no question which one is stronger at the present, but that was not the case oh. all the way up until about 1970. The North was a larger country than South Korea, and it had a, a balance of power that always made it questionable. It's not so now. Numerically, North Korea outnumbers the South Korean military by a long shot. It's about 1.4 million before mobilization, whereas South Korea has about 620,000, augmented by roughly 30 to 34,000 uh, Americans. By the way, you hear the number 28,500. We can talk about that later if you want to. But it's a very small American contingent, a very large South Korean contingent, and a huge North Korean contingent that still holds it apart because of the politics that cause pressure between the two sides. So what kind of Korea will it be? What happens if it has a nuclear weapon still? Can a unified Korea have nuclear weapons? Well, as a matter of policy, the United States says no, and so does South Korea, and so does the international community. But what about in reality? How, how does it ultimately end up? Can the mineral wealth untapped in North Korea be joined with the production capability of one of the most advanced countries in the world, economically and electronically, South Korea. Can those two be joined in a way that they can still be viewed as not a threat economically around the world? To China, to Dude. Japan, bless you, to South Korea, a competitor? What does it look like? So uh, these are the kind of pitfalls on how do you get to a reunified condition? What does it look like militarily? Do you join the, those two armies and make it a two million person army? Do you reduce both of them down? Is there an international body that can, that can or should oversee a further demilitarization of the Korean Peninsula as a piece of reunification? These are all really important questions like those that were facing the brand new UN Security Council in 1950. Uh -huh. or they were facing the U.S. Joint Chiefs in 1948, or they were facing the uh, State War Navy Coordinating Committee in 1945 before the Yalta Conference that drew those lines. These are tough questions, and they have to be addressed, or we're going to have an outcome in the future that we don't like any better than we had the present. Yeah, for sure. I see that our friend uh, Kevin Batool has written a, a nice note to you there as well. Kevin, great artilleryman and great friend as well. Thanks, hey, just as a break, um, you're, you're watching uh, Veteran Voices with uh, General Retired Vince Brooks. Today's the 70th anniversary of the Korean War, and we're bringing this to you from the National Veterans Memorial Museum. And um, there are two things that are significant about that. One is national people ask, how, how can you be national in Ohio? Well, we're in Austin, Texas right now with with Vince Brooks, and uh, and we'll go around the world to get great leaders and present them to our audience. And the other national is, uh, it's a great name, and it was signed into law by the president. We get no federal funds and state funds, so if you're out there, please join as a member. Find a way to come see us. Bring your association and reunions to us when, uh, when we're all ready to do that. And come and see how we tell the story of veterans from all eras, from all services. And um, well, back to you. So now let's let's shift uh, our fighting stance a little bit towards the, uh, you know, kind of leadership lessons. Our our veterans. Uh, we we establish a veteran leader certification uh, course, twelve modules with Ohio State University, the John Glenn School, and eighteen uh, began. Sixteen graduated with with uh, twelve hours of uh, master's credit. Um, we know that when a veteran enters a company, a corporation, or starts their own business, it's going to take off. And, and as the NVMM, uh, we also know that their HR reps ask, what have you been doing the, at night the last couple of years? Why don't you have more school? And most of our veterans say, I was doing night patrols. So we use this platform uh, sincerely to help. As you have uh, soldiered uh, at every level, and especially tactically at every level, uh, with the troops at every level, uh, and now you see veterans in, um, in our communities. What what, what uh, reflections do you have about how veterans make America super and improve their uh, neighborhoods, their schools, and, and the like? 
Yeah, I see veterans making contributions all over the place. As I think back to my own experience, I, I was running into lots of them along the way and didn't even realize it. I didn't have the context of what it meant. Even though I was a military kid, I knew what a veteran was. I lived in the house of one. But the, the math teacher over here and the science teacher over there who were veterans of Korea and veterans of Vietnam, both uh, in th those cases respectively, I didn't have the full understanding of it, but they were there and they impacted me. So because they said they wanted to continue to find a way to serve, and in their particular case through teaching, I'm impacted. And so were others. The veterans are out there doing this sort of thing in so many places. Maybe they're coaching, maybe they're CEOs, and we see both. And I have to add uh, Korean veterans to this just as a uh, since the, we're on the 70th anniversary, those Korean augmentees to the United States Army are incredible. They are the best and brightest of Korean society, and they serve right alongside Americans as part of American units. They definitely carry our DNA, and they're doing amazing things. Uh, when I was in command in Korea, the prime minister was a former Korean augmentee to the U.S. Army. Hello. All right. So this, this is what veterans bring. I like the point about, well, I was doing night patrols. That's a different form of night school. <laughs> yes. And trust me, they were learning a lot. They were learning about what it means to be part of a team, what it means to carry the weight of someone else if they need it, and knowing that they're not slacking because you're not going to let them slack, but because they actually needed your help. Uh, being willing to go as a team together into some great danger when every other human instinct would say, oh, you're on your own, let's turn around and run out of here. But that's not what they learned. That was what their night school was all about. And surely that's of value in so many sectors of our society, whether it's policing or teaching, whether it's running a corporation or working out on the line, just trying to get a job done. It doesn't really matter what it is. Our veterans are bringing an awful lot to bear. Let me just say that, uh, like you, Mike, I'm trying to find a way to still give back and to find ways to take care of our veterans. And uh, in addition to the, the, the great purposes of your museum, which I personally have not seen and intend to as soon as uh, normalcy comes back to travel, whatever that looks like in our future. But I, I'm also on two particular nonprofit organizations that I just want to highlight. The first is relative to today, the Korea Defense Veterans Association. That's for all those people who served in Korea after the armistice was signed, all the way up to the present. I love it. Okay, so we have from 1953 to now, and it's an amazingly large, large number of people. So Korean Defense Veterans Association, KDVA, uh, please look it up and take a look at it. In addition to that, more directly helping veterans, I'm uh, on the board of the Gary Sinise Foundation. And of course, Gary Sinise is a great actor, but he's a true patriot and a great humanitarian who has devoted himself and his success to the benefit of our veterans, our defenders who are still serving, our first responders and their families and those in need. And there's some really great stuff that's happening by the Gary Sinise Foundation. So check that out also, GarySiniseFoundation.org. But uh, so, you know, getting past the, the, the commentary on those associations, let me just say, Mike, that uh, our, our troops have a lot to offer. It doesn't matter what service they were in they have something beneficial to society. Every now and then we have someone who has problems and issues, and they're the ones who we need to be helping the most. That's right. And I do find that there are, are a lot of veterans still who are just working through the challenges of not falling through the cracks. And we really need to make sure we're finding them, especially veteran to veteran, but beyond that, in the communities, find someone and give them help. Maybe it's just shepherding someone through a process of getting a claim done on an invisible wound. We all know about the invisible wounds of war. And they're out there. And it's very difficult to document those, especially early in a conflict. So I draw a parallel between what soldiers and warriors were feeling in 1950 and what they're feeling even in our time, let's say 2003. And I know a number of veterans right now who are just trying to work with the reality of things as they were. All the medical system wasn't in high gear like it was by 2006. The reporting systems were not in place. 
the way to treat wounds, the tracking when someone got wounded and where they went. Documentation is lost and they struggle with getting claims done. Well, we got to help them. We have to help them. So our society owes that to its veterans and our veterans owe that to one another. So thanks for what you're doing and thanks for letting me comment on that. Yeah, I appreciate it. The, for sure. The, uh, and that, if, if, you, if you don't know, we're not a normal museum, ladies and gentlemen. We, we are the National Veterans Memorial Museum. We're the one and only. When they first thought to build this, it was going to be the Franklin County uh, Veterans Memorial Museum. And they went to Washington, D.C., to the Smithsonian to find the National Veterans Memorial Museum, and it didn't exist. So they came back and said, we can A, be a good ranger and occupy by force and claim it, or B, go through Congress and Joyce Beatty and, and Steve Stivers and Senator Portman and Senator Brown linked arms together and uh, ramrodded it through 100 uh, percent on both houses and signed. So but we're not normal. We do programming like this. Um, very in the end, thousands will get to meet Vince Brooks today. And that's that sounds OK. But actually, thousands will get to hear your perspectives on leadership, on people, on doing things that matter. And that's that's what we bring uh, to the table or to the playing field and much, much more as well. If you if 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 you were going to speak to uh, 35 year old veterans and below, um, and then you were going to speak to 35 to like 60, and then you were going to speak to uh, our Vietnam and, and Korean vets. So three categories for the first, the younger category on leadership, you know, um, if you if you view Vince Brooks life, ladies and gentlemen, there was always another mountain that he wanted to climb, just like in Korea, right? Using the metaphor and you went after it and you got it and not personally and, and not for credit, but you went after because it, it was an important thing where you could influence even more. Um, so for those youngsters, how what leadership would you give them? What mentorship would you give them about how they go forward in the next 20 years of their life? Well, the first thing I say to, to all of them, no matter what their age group is, thanks. Thanks for serving. Okay, thanks for being part of that 1%. Thanks for taking on the danger on behalf of our nation. And it doesn't matter what generation they're from, that applies. And so that's the first thing for all of them. Uh, and and I, I think we all ought to say thanks anytime we run into any veteran of any era. Uh, the, the next thing I say to them is, for the ones who are still serving, the younger ones, those 35 and under, who might still be uh, on the team wearing the jersey, it is just just do your best every day. You don't set out to make history. Uh, I've been blessed to be part of history and to make some history, but I can tell you in no case did I seek it. And I know that that's the case for even those Korean War veterans that I would sit down with or the Vietnam veterans like my, my father. Uh, or our colleagues that we serve with in our time uh, in, in the uniform, you don't seek to make history. If you do, you're probably on the wrong team. What you do is you seek to do your best every single day to the best of your ability. And you might find yourself in a circumstance that historians write about. That's how history is made. Huh. Okay. It's recorded by somebody else. It's performed by these type of people we're talking about by simply doing their best. So that would be my encouragement to them. Just give it your best. Don't forget about the person on your left and right, because that's why you're here. We don't need you by yourself. We need you as part of a team, and it's the ultimate team of teams. There will, be, there will never be a greater privilege than serving on this ultimate team of teams that you're on right now. So that's my message to the youngins. Uh, to the older generation, folks, uh, it starts with thanks again, but it's a reminder of using this mountain metaphor that we infantrymen can certainly appreciate. When you're slogging up the side of a mountain, it's easy to realize that you're fatigued. But every now and then, you need to take a short pause and look back in the opposite direction and see what you've just overcome. And so for those 35 to 60-year-olds, uh, some who are still in the formation and uh, many who have now crossed over to the other side like us, look at what you've done. Look at what you've overcome and how you advanced the nature of what our military service is today. Look at how you moved from uh, uh, 
creating a condition where society didn't trust us to now becoming the most trusted institution in society. That didn't come by accident, and we, did, we can never take that for granted. But that is part of the mountain range they have crossed if they're in that age group. And we have to tell them, well done, well done. And now turn back around, pick up your rucksack, and keep, <laughs> keep going up the hill until it's your time to stop. A uh, lesson that we all learned very well. Until the, uh, the older generation, like the Korean War veterans, but let me not bypass the Vietnam veterans uh, among that older group, too. Uh, first, it's just an appreciation for all they did and all they went through. They did the best they could at the time that they were serving. And many of them admire us and that first group you described, the younger generation now serving. They said, hey, we were never as good as these troops are now. And we tell them, yes, you were. You know, you had to deal with something very different. And you did it. You did what you needed to do. And you did it for the right reasons, to the best of your ability. So the deepest appreciation goes to them. For our Vietnam vets, I always add something else. And that is, welcome home. You know, they didn't hear that the way we've heard that. The way some of the 60 years and younger people have heard that. And I believe that we have an obligation. We of that younger generation than they have the obligation to share what our citizenry is giving to us now, which is appreciation, respect, admiration, never taking it for granted, but passing it on, passing it back to that generation, because surely they set the course for us. Sure. And they were deprived of that, and they should receive it now. So for veterans of the modern era who have had many a citizen say to them, thank you for your service, I say the same thing, and I try to reflect it right off of me and onto a Vietnam veteran. Thank you for your service. Thanks for serving in a really difficult time. Thanks for doing your best, and uh, and thanks for being who you are even now. Um, so I'd like you just to, we're going to wrap up here in just a second, um, but I, I'd like you just to uh, give a, a comment or two to your reflections on the significance of being a man of character and integrity. Um, I, I was told by one of my drivers once, I didn't know generals worked so hard and, and I didn't know they followed the rules. <laughs> so you're, you're, a, you're a prime example of, of, a, of that man of character who always does what's right. But give, give this audience your thoughts as well, please. Well, I certainly try to do that, Mike. You know, I'm as imperfect as any human. And I would say that you certainly are the exemplar for us as well as a man of character, a man of integrity who always strives to do the right thing. And so that's that's why I and so many of our friends admire you so much and always have. But uh, it's not easy to be a person of character, man or woman. Uh, pressures might cause you to try to choose something easier. I, I learned a long time ago, there's a thing called the cadet prayer that I learned at West Point. And it has a line in it of the importance of choosing the harder right over the easier wrong, and to never be content with a half truth when the whole can be won. I mean, these are important words to live by. And if one tries to pursue such a, such a course, looking for that harder right, that means standing up and saying that something's wrong when others might say, this isn't wrong. It could be like our comments on integration earlier or the issues that we face even now where there might be implicit bias, it's standing up and saying it's, it's wrong, even when others are not saying it's wrong. It might be enough to cause people to recognize that something has changed that is worthy of their attention. It could be in any number of areas, uh, not taking a shortcut when you really know that you should put the full effort in. How many of us have been on a 12-mile road march or some sort of rucksack run and maybe the, the whole group is kind of spread out and you could take a shortcut. You might even be able to, you might know the route well enough to kind of bypass and the point where it's going to bend and come back, you cut a cut. Whoa, what's stopping you from doing that? What stops any person from doing that? Character. Their knowledge that cheating doesn't give you a reward that is worth keeping. Mm -hmm. Only taking the full course and putting the full measure in is worth keeping. So this is, this is a practice. It's a life practice. And there will be times in life where those who are trying to follow a, a principled and honor, honorable life 
are bumped pretty hard by society, by peer pressure, by a decision that's just heavy to carry. And if that's the case, then they should keep going, keep going, just live and set an example. Fantastic. Well, we're, we're, we're going to wrap up, uh, but everyone, uh, you're, you're watching the National Veterans Memorial Museum and General Vince Brooks and our discussion. Uh, really, one of the things that we got to learn from General Lloyd Austin was demonstrate inspired leadership. And you've done that in spades for us and, and presenting your thoughts and your insights and your, your reflections and memories. So I'd like to uh, thank you on behalf of our audience and, and all of our men and women who've served and who are serving in their families as well, our special Gold Star family members, yes. dearest audience of all. And I'd like to pass the microphone to uh, Bill Butler, Colonel U.S. Army retired and our chief of staff to wrap us up. So thanks, Vince. Thank you so much, Mike. It's an honor to be with you. Yeah. Gentlemen, thanks for a great discussion and helping us celebrate the uh, 70th anniversary of the uh, start of the Korean War. So thank you very much, sir, for joining us today. A couple of final announcements for everybody. Uh, so just as a reminder, despite our national designation, we're an unfunded nonprofit. We don't receive any funding from federal, state or local governments. Our programming like this one, Veterans Voices, and our commemorative event, events are made possible through the generous donations of our members, sponsors, and donors. If you enjoyed this session of Veterans Voices or other programming, consider becoming a member or donating. Uh, this Saturday, June 27th, we welcome the public back to the museum for the first time since March 13th. So we closed our doors when the governor of Ohio enacted stay-at-home directives on March 13th. We've pivoted to virtual events and programming and online uh, events like this. Uh, and we welcomed our members back on Tuesday and then the general public this Saturday. So we are open and we are ready to welcome uh, the public back. And then on Monday, the 6th of July, we're hosting a Red Cross blood drive. Nationally, the Red Cross and our, our, our medical system is critically short of blood. We typically have three days of blood on supply um, for those patients in need of it. Uh, and right now our medical system only has one day of supply on hand. So every pint of blood that we collect saves and helps save three lives. Uh, we did one in June and we helped impact 66 lives and we're doing one in July on the 6th. Uh, so I would invite everybody if you are able and willing, uh, come to the museum it takes about 20 or 30 minutes, but give the gift of life uh, by donating some blood. Uh, that concludes our ceremony and commemoration of the 70th anniversary of the Korean War and our, our most recent veteran voices. So thank you, gentlemen, again, and everybody have a great day. Thank you. We'll thank see you. you. Take see care. Roger that. All right.